Okay, it's still October, it's still scary season, so let's talk about vampires. There have been so many vampire movies over the years, and let's face it, most of them are terrible. Here are five that are not. Okay, we will begin, why the hell not, with The Lost Boys. How can you not love The Lost Boys? If, if you're in any way connected to my generation, seriously, how can you not love The Lost Boys? When this movie came out, um, 87, I think it actually came out early 88 in Britain. This was what me and my mates looked like, or is what we were trying to look like anyway. So this movie felt aimed directly at us. Actually, when it came out, a lot of critics and sort of serious movie fans had a bit of a problem with The Lost Boys because they felt it unfairly overshadowed Catherine Bigelow's Near Dark, which came out at about the same time and is an altogether more serious take on a similar subject. And don't get me wrong, Near Dark is great. It's got Lance Henriksen and Bill Paxton in it. There are some fantastic moments, but the central character is a total blank space and the ending is frankly bullshit. The ending of The Lost Boys is one of the best punchlines in cinema history. And watching it again, all these years later, one is struck by the fact that it works a hell of a lot better than it should. Tonally, it's very uneven, and one can't help but feel deliberately so. Because it is, yes, basically a teen movie, but it's actually two parallel teen movies pitched at very different age groups. The whole plot involving Michael, the elder brother protagonist who is being lured into the vampire gang, is all very fraught and serious in a kind of proto-Dawson's Creek sort of way. Whereas the stuff with his kid brother Sam and the Frog Brothers, these self-appointed vampire hunters, that's pitched way younger. That kind of plays like the Goonies or something. And these two tones should clash horribly, but somehow they mesh. And it gave the world Keeper Sutherland and reintroduced a whole generation to the doors. And I think the soundtrack album actually made more money than the movie did. Next up, and staying very much in the 80s, albeit a slightly earlier bit of the 80s, we have The Hunger. Now, if The Lost Boys is a bit like being dipped in late 80s, The Hunger is like being drenched in early 80s. It is magnificently over-directed by Ridley Scott's even more over directy brother, Tony. And it's got... Catherine Deneuve and David Bowie as a ridiculously glamorous vampire couple. The opening sequence is set in this goth club in New York with David Bowie and Catherine Deneuve prowling the place looking for victims while Bauhaus play Bela Lugosi's Dead and Bauhaus are actually there. They are the opening titles. So yeah, big goth movie. But plot-wise, it's an interesting spin on vampirism. Catherine Deneuve plays this many, many thousands of year old completely immortal vampire woman and David Bowie plays her hundreds of years old, as it turns out, possibly not quite so immortal vampire boyfriend. And with magnificent callousness, as the clock starts to run out on poor old David Bowie, resulting in the deployment of some incredibly convincing old age makeup, the vampire lady starts to transfer her affections to a glamorous woman doctor played by Susan Sarandon. So within the universe of this movie, vampires can turn humans into vampires, but... You never get to be a real vampire. An interesting distinction that I don't think I've seen anywhere else. Okay, number three, we have the most recent entry, Let the Right One In. This is weirdly beautiful. Now, this story now exists in several different forms. Uh, it's based on a source novel by John Alquist. Uh, there was the original Swedish movie by Thomas Alfredson. Matt Reeves, um, who went on to make the Planet of the Apes reboots and The Batman, then did an American remake, which I've not seen, but I'm told is pretty good as American remakes of European movies go. And there was a stage version a few years later. But I'm going to be talking about the Swedish movie. One of the fascinating things about this movie is it shows us a Sweden that I'd certainly never seen depicted anywhere else. In Britain, we tend to think of Sweden as being this extremely sort of hygienic and well-ordered place, and the Swedes as all being fantastically healthy, blonde and glamorous. This is set on a dog-rough estate outside Stockholm, and all the locals are these kind of shabby freaks and alcoholics. Anyway, living on this dog rough estate, we have Oscar the Weird Kid. And just for once, the weird kid in a movie is genuinely weird. Quite tellingly, the movie's set in about 1983, but everything Oscar wears is very 1970s. So he's obviously wearing hand-me-down stuff, possibly from his, his absent dad because his parents are getting divorced. And he's got this kind of, you know, 70s helmet haircut, and he experiences violent revenge fantasies. He's got a secret dagger that he keeps hidden under his pillow, and he goes out at night um, stabbing trees to death, which is one of the ways he attracts the attention of the even weirder little girl who's just moved in next door with an older extremely protective gentleman who may or may not be her dad or granddad and the first thing he does when he moves in is cover a bedroom window in cardboard so this is kind of 
a slightly awkward pre-teen romance interspersed with moments of extraordinary violence. And again, the ending is perfect and almost certainly not the ending you're expecting. Okay, okay, next up we have Bram Stoker's Dracula, the 1992 one, directed by Francis Ford Coppola. I had to have a Dracula in here somewhere. And this, in many ways, I think, has become the definitive one. Although, maybe not to begin with. When this movie first came out, I was actually kind of annoyed by it, I'll be honest. You see, on the one hand, I was thinking, oh good, somebody finally made a movie that tries to do the book. Because most Dracula movies do bits of the book, or they just kind of take the book as a vague inspiration and then do something else entirely. But to their credit, Francis Coppola and pals managed to get pretty much the whole of the book into this movie. But what annoyed me was what they added. Now, I did like the addition of the prologue in which Dracula is directly connected to Vlad the Impaler. But what I didn't like was the romantic subplot that this sequence introduces. The idea that Dracula comes to London because he thinks that Mina, Jonathan Arker's fiance, is the reincarnation of his dead wife. I'll be honest, this kind of wound me up because I'm not a fan of the over-romanticization of Dracula. I'm not much of a fan of the romanticization of vampires in general. But Dracula in particular is not... Dracula in particular, is not a lovelorn romantic. He's just a parasite. He's a destroyer. The reason Dracula wants to come to London is because, essentially, he's had it with Transylvania. He's had it with dwindling numbers of villagers who are all clued up to the whole vampire thing and have started to festoon themselves with crucifixes and garlic. He wants to come to live in a big, bustling city full of warm-blooded people who don't believe in vampires. Dinner is served. But I have grown to love this movie over the years. Partly just because of what it looks like. I mean, visually, it is one of the most sumptuous movies ever made. Partly because I've kind of warmed to the romantic subplot. And in particular, there's some seriously horny moments in this movie, if that's what you're looking for. I can even live with Keanu Reeves' accent. Because it's Keanu, and how can you not love Keanu? And Gary Oldman is fantastic, although, again, when it came out, something which kind of annoyed me is how much shape-shifting Dracula does in this film. You almost never see him appearing as the same entity twice. When you first meet him, he's a kind of Japanese grandma. And then, when he first arrives in England, he's a sort of horny werewolf. And then he's the dandy foreign prince. Or he's the emaciated rat zombie who turns into a big stack of rats. When he sneaks into bed with Renona Ryder, he does it in the form of a cloud of green fart gas, which is one way of doing it, I suppose. But again, over the years, I've kind of gotten over that and just drinking Gary Oldman's charisma. All right, my favourite vampire movie of all time, and this is slightly cheating because it was initially a TV miniseries, but it did get a theatrical release in some territories. 1979's Salem's Lot, directed by Toby Chainsaw Massacre Hooper from the book by Stephen King. This I saw when I was about 12, about three years after it came out, and it was the single most piss scary thing I'd ever seen in my life, and I've rewatched it many times since, and it's not just because I was 12, this is possibly the most piss-scary vampire movie ever made. All the scarier for the fact that it was made for TV, so Toby Hooper doesn't just get to chuck gallons of blood at the screen. In fact, I think the only blood you see in this whole movie is hanging up in an IV in a hospital. So rather than gore out, Toby Hooper's got to go full-on for creepy, and oh boy, does he nail creepy. Now, Everybody goes on about the bit when the vampire little boy appears outside his brother's bedroom window, scraping on the glass, as being the most memorable scene in this film. And it is extraordinarily good. But the bit that fucked me up was the Mr. Barlow reveal in the jail cell. If you've not read the book or seen the film, Stephen King kind of intended it as a vague rerun of Dracula, but set in a small town in Maine, because everything Stephen King writes is set in a small town in Maine. And with, again, a protagonist who is a lot like Stephen King. Because most of the works of Stephen King can be summarised in the sentence, 
something unbelievably horrible happens to somebody very like Stephen King. But it's about a town called Salem's Lot which slowly succumbs to the curse of vampirism after the arrival of an ancient vampire called Mr. Barlow and his familiar, a kind of Renfield character called Mr. Straker. And Mr. Straker in the film is played by James Mason, who is wonderful because it's James Mason. The troubled author protagonist is played by David Soule, who is unexpectedly brilliant at being haunted and troubled. And Mr. Barlow is just the scariest fucking thing you've ever seen in your life. This is where it deviates from the book. In the book, Mr. Barlow is basically Dracula. He's very urbane and sophisticated and quite seductive. And when this movie was remade by, I think, the TNT channel, again as a miniseries uh, in the early noughties, starring Rob Lowe as the central character, they restored this idea of Mr. Barlow, and he's a kind of vampire nobleman played by the great Rutger Hauer. Although I haven't seen that, I've not heard good things about it. But in this, Mr. Barlow is just basically vampirism squared. He is like the essence of vampirism. He is vampirism with all its humanity taken away. He's played by uh, an old German actor called Reggie Nalder. His appearance is strongly based on Max Schreck in the 1922 Nosferatu. But he's just the scariest thing you've ever seen. I'm not going to include any visuals of him. A, because you're probably not ready for it if you don't know what's coming. But B, because if you do actually then go away and watch this, I want that reveal to hit you as hard as it hit me. So yeah, Salem's Lot. Pure, undiluted nightmare juice. So, there you go. Five genuinely good vampire movies. I'm sure you're already furious about the ones I haven't mentioned. Into the comments they go. See you soon. Thanks for watching. If you liked it, please hit like and share. If you'd like to see more, please hit subscribe. And if you'd like to help me make more, please visit patreon.com slash mitchben.